Great. Thanks so much, Mara. Thanks for having me. I hope so. you all get something from this talk, and thanks for coming. So I really wanted to cover three things here. I want to talk about the Eurozone. That's the currency we're in, along with 16 other European countries, not including the UK. And as you know, it's in a bit of a crisis at the moment. A moment. So I'll talk about the Eurozone, what's wrong with it, how the crisis evolved. Then I want to talk in particular, most of what I want to talk about is the Irish situation, in particular, how the Irish banks got Ireland into so much trouble and where things stand at the moment from the perspective of Ireland in the Eurozone crisis. And then last thing I'll talk about the future, is Ireland and is the Eurozone on a path to get out of this? And what are the likely outcomes? I'll just briefly discuss um, that. <coughs> so um, I want to start with a picture of John Kenneth Galbraith. He's a late 20th century uh, witty Canadian-American economist actually coming back into f favor now. He talked a lot about fads, yeah, social fads, and the influence of social delusions and business fads on the economy. And he did a lot of work in particular about how the, the 1920s, roaring 20s, led to the Great Depression. And it has a lot of resonance now, in fact, in what happened in the noughties, as they call it, the 2000, the 2008 period, and how that led to the current crisis. But in particular, as I said, he was quite witty. One of his witticisms was, the great thing about being an economist is the more you screw up, the more they need you. And it's true, the last few years as an economist, you get more and more attention to what you're saying, where people always ignored you during the noughties. All of a sudden, we're very stylish in giving talks like this, okay? Which is a bad thing, okay? And maybe that needs to go away. Um, I want to lay my cards on the table and say, I'm not one of the economists who's gonna come in here and say, I told you this would happen. I missed it, okay? I screwed up. In fact, I do risk modeling, financial risk modeling. So I just say, I am not one of the people who can claim I saw it coming. What I say about the past is with hindsight, and I, I don't want to pretend otherwise. Okay. So first I want to talk about the euro. Okay. The euro is this currency zone now with 17 countries, which is a locked-in set of exchange rates where these basically all of the countries are in the same currency. And it, as you know, is causing enormous dislocation and problems in many of the countries, really throughout the zone. From Germany to Portugal, the euro is problematic. Why did we do it? What was the reason for the euro? Okay. Let's look in particular at the financial reasons, because there are successes associated with the euro. This is one of the big reasons for the euro. And if you understand this graph, you'll understand not only the reasons for the euro, or one of the reasons for the euro, but the problems in the euro. This is the relationship between the Italian lira and the German Deutsche Mark from 1980 till 2009. Throughout that period, Italy, the central bank in Italy and the Italian government had one goal with their exchange rate policy. This graph was not to slope downward. Okay? That was their goal. That was their overriding goal. This line was to be straight. Okay? And that was what they tried to do for 20 years. Did they succeed? No, they failed, and they failed, and they failed, and they failed, and they failed. It just went, it continued to slope down for 20 years as they fought and fought and fought to keep it strong, to keep the lira strong, a hard money policy. And they just couldn't do it, okay? The political system just didn't allow them to do it. The union said, oh, we know they're not credible. We know they're going to relax the exchange rate. So we're going to bid up our wages, okay? Because we know they'll, they won't go through with it. The pensioners, as well, said, we need more pension money because we know they're going to, they're going to inflate away any gains. Everyone, the political system, everything worked against what was their key motivation. And it failed, except at the end. Once they locked into the euro, it worked. Okay? All of a sudden, Italy had a hard currency. Note at the end, once it's in the euro, because they're the same currency as Germany, they now have a hard currency relative to Germany. So in fact, there's a success. Italy now has a hard currency, as does Ireland, 
as does Portugal, as does Belgium, and even France, because France had the same desire and the same, though not as dramatic, the same failure throughout this period. So all these currencies which wanted hard money now have hard money. Okay? So there's your success. Now there are other issues, of course. There's the issue of trade and the no need to exchange currency as you move across borders. But this is really from the financial side, the key motivation for the euro. And in a sense, it worked. We got what we asked for. Okay? But many people see, why did it have to be such a brittle system? Why did this euro system have to be so inflexible and brittle? That was not a bug in the euro design. That was a feature. If you know the term, the joke that programmers say, when you say there's a bug in what your, program, your computer program, that's not a bug, it's a feature. Okay? That's true of the euro. Its brittleness was intended. It's a feature of the euro that it's brittle. Okay? That was how the Italian state was able to lock in a hard currency, by forcing the system so that it cannot leave. If the euro were a system where Italy could be in the euro, but it can leave any time, it would never have had a hard currency. It would have lasted three months. And then the demands of the system for a soft currency would have overwhelmed it. So the, the locking in is part of the success of the euro. And this is actually a very old strategy. This is a, this is a third century um, mosaic, and that is Odysseus. And if you remember the story of Odysseus, what does he do? He locks himself onto the ship's mast. And I have a quote here about, uh, this is from Homer's Odyssey. Okay? You, okay, it says, this is Churchy telling Odysseus how he can listen to the sirens. The sirens are these lovely singing uh, magical creatures on two sides of the strait. And they're sailing through the strait. And anyone who hears the sirens is so enchanted by their beautiful singing that they're drawn off the straight and narrow path and into the rocks. Okay? So what does, Homer, what does Odysseus do? You must drive straight on past, but melt down sweet wax of honey, and with it stop your companion's ears so none can listen. The rest, that is, but if you yourself are wanting to hear them, then have them tie you hand and foot on the fast ship, standing upright against the mast with the ropes and lashed around it, so that you can have joy in hearing the song of the sirens. But if you supplicate your men and implore them to set you free, then they must tie you fast with even more lashings. This worked too, okay? Odysseus got to hear the sirens, and he sailed safely through the strait by locking himself onto the mast, okay? And that's what we've done. We now have a hard currency, so does Greece, so does Italy. We didn't matter in that sense, but Italy mattered and France mattered. So one of the key motivations is to lock in, create a brittle currency system where we have to have a hard currency system. Okay? This was not really the key issue for Ireland. For Ireland, why did Ireland go along? Well, Ireland was very into I'm sorry, where's Ireland? <laughs> Okay, I want to talk about Germany, then I'll talk about Ireland. What about Germany? Why did Germany go along with such a system? Okay, well, you probably remember Faulty Towers. There's a running joke on Faulty Towers. They'd have German guests come in, and Basel Faulty would say, don't talk about the war, okay? Don't talk about the war with the Germans. And then, of course, he'd end up talking about the war. He, he put his foot in his mouth, okay? Well, I worked in the city in the late 90s, in the city of London, and I used to visit... Clients. I was selling risk management systems, okay? And I'd visit clients, and client support would always whisper to me, don't talk about the euro as a problem. They're German, they're German clients. Don't talk about problems with the euro. So I'd stand up here, and I'd have to make sure I didn't say anything negative about the euro, because the Germans just had this emotional commitment. It was really the same thing. It was basically, it was basically liberal anti-nationalism. The Germans just felt... We are good Europeans. We want everyone to be one body. So it's actually a good thing, but it did make them blind, okay? The Belgians, the Germans, the Dutch, the hard currency countries were blind to the failures of the Euro. Why? Basically, for good motivations. They believed partly, it's not the whole story, but partly, they believed in liberal anti-nationalism. 
They want to take the hard currency, the Deutsche Mark, and share it, okay, to bring Europe together. So the Germans are partly to blame, but partly their blindness was, in a sense, motivated positively to a good extent, okay? So there isn't really just goodies and baddies. There's blindness for good motivation, okay? That's another thing that happened. They certainly were blind. The Germans allowed Greece into the Eurozone. Now, looking back at that, that was a ridiculous decision. Again, with hindsight, the idea that you, Greece, Italy coming in, is marginal, and it, you know, was, it seems to possibly work. But Greece coming in was clearly, you know, grossly in error. So they clearly were blinded okay, by something. Okay. What about the Irish? Well, the Irish didn't really matter. Okay, they didn't matter much, but they were, they were welcome. Okay, Ireland was welcome. Why did the Irish join? Well, it wasn't so much the hard currency. Ireland did not have that same experience as uh, Italy with a constant depreciation of its currency. It had managed, in many cases, to ke keep a peg, for instance, to the British pound. But Ireland was also enthusiastic, most financial economists in Ireland, and it was basically because they saw it as a chance to lower their cost of investment. This is their cost of investment under a small, more peripheral currency, like the punt. Joining a big currency area, like the euro, okay, was going to lower the cost of investment, and that was going to increase investment. This was what many Irish economists, myself among them, as someone who was at this point interested in and, and, and visiting Ireland, okay, this is what we believe. We're going to lower our cost of in, um, investment and increase investment because the cost of funds was going to decline when we moved from being a small peripheral currency with all the risk associated with that to a member of a big currency block, okay, <coughs> locked in at hard currency rates. What did we get? Well, something worse. Something that we didn't really predict, which was over-investment, a credit flood. Okay? Ireland got a credit flood. In fact, looking back, we realized there was so much investment for bad reasons, bad business decisions, bad regulatory decisions, that in fact many of the investments were negative in their in their returns. So we're actually getting, we're throwing money at investment projects, okay, with negative returns. The, when I say we there, that's the business interest and the business community in particular, the banks and property developers together. We're taking German money and core money and throwing it away because of self-managerial self-interest. Okay, I'm gonna look in a little more detail what happened in Ireland. But basically, this is the key thing. It was essentially a credit flood. We had a flood of foreign credit when we joined this big currency zone and had bad financial regulation. Okay. Let's look now in more detail at Ireland, sort of work out the steps of where this, how this affected our banks, and what in particular happened. This is the asset side of the Irish banking system. Keep in mind with banks, asset and liability, it's like my right side is your left side. It's the same with banks. Their asset side is your liability side. So you have more mortgages, you think of them as liabilities, for bank mortgages are assets. Credit card debt, we think of them as liabilities. Those are assets to banks. You might have a savings account to a bank that's a liability because that's an asset to you. You might have a checking account, that's your asset, it's their liability. So this is their asset side, business and individuals' liability side. And let's look at what happened to these banks. The red bar is a key thing here. This is property development. In, in traditional commercial banking, this should be zero. Property development is not considered an appropriate activity for commercial banks. They're only supposed to lend for a property, in the traditional view, when they already have the rent wall locked in. So short-term, last-minute banking. Otherwise, it's supposed to be equity. And what you can see is that exploded over the noughties period. So the red part just grew enormously. Okay? So on the asset side, you had a big growth 
of property development, which is in fact not even an appropriate activity for banks. And as we now know, those are very bad investment decisions. There was also a lot of growth of mortgages. Okay? So on the asset side, way too much property development growth and, and also uh, quite strong, probably too strong growth in mortgages. What about on the liability side? Where was the money coming from? It was coming from foreign borrowing. The banks were paying for these very risky investments by borrowing from foreign, mostly Eurozone bank, banks. Okay? So they're taking short-term money from foreign banks and using it for very speculative investments. So this is, if you follow kind of the, you know, the entrails of what happened in the crisis. This is a little bit old news, but that's the key thing. And here again, this red area is the key one, along with the yellow one. This is foreign borrowing. Okay. Now the yellow one is a little bit less bad because it is not coming out of. It's it's all going into foreign lending. Okay. Whereas red is actual foreign borrowing being used, recycled back into domestic lending. Note. This borrowing is what's called hot money. These are quickly reversed, okay? And note here, you can see it climbing down. This is the hot money drifting out of Ireland, okay? A lot of these are very short-term institutional deposits and short-term bonds that the foreign banks can, uh, you know, uh, liquidate at their pleasure, okay? Well, what we do uh, in, in economics to look at policy and sort of understand what went wrong is what's called counterfactual policy analysis. What we do, and this is a, you know, a standard tool, is we take a decision in the past and we want to we think about was that a good decision or a bad decision? What were the implications of it? We remove it and then we create a new history. We say let's change an old decision and let's see how key it was because we know how the decision feeds through the system, let's change that decision and see what the system would look like. Okay? It's just like, I like the picture of Gwyneth Paltrow, sliding doors. Okay? That is basically the same idea. She has, there's this movie where Gwyneth Paltrow is running onto a train, and in one reality, she makes it onto the train. Okay? And then she gets home and she finds a boyfriend cheating on her with another girl, and her life goes one way, okay? In the other reality, she hesitates and misses her train, and her life goes another way, okay? Well, that's basically counterfactual simulations. Now, I'm going to do that for a minute. This is work with Brian O'Kelly on the Irish banks. What would have happened if we had been slightly more sensible in financial regulation during the bubble period, okay? Well, in fact... With a little bit of a change in bank regulation, okay, most of the Irish problems would have gone away. Okay? Most of the crash would have gone away. And thinking through that reality, so now we're in a different reality, we're in a made-up reality, where the Irish Central Bank and the Irish Financial Regulator prevented the banking sector from taking these extremely risky bets on property development funded by net foreign <coughs> borrowing, okay? Just, to, just make them more sensible, reasonable regulation, what's called prudent regulation. That little change would have really changed the outcome, okay? So here's the asset side. When we enforce a condition that uh, property development cannot be more than 10% of stable liabilities, which are um, domestic deposits, which are on the other side, okay? So you can only have 10% property development assets relative to domestic deposits, okay? And we also put in a condition, and note, you change the, you drastically reduce this scary red part, okay? Which caused the problems on the asset side. We do the same thing on the liability side. Here we force the net foreign borrowing to be cut. Again, this should have been controlled by the financial regulator and wasn't. So let's control it, okay? So this is our simulated reality. We're just allowing the system to be more prudent in its behavior, okay? And those things go away. What would happen to the Irish economy? Well, you'd have much, you know, obviously, by construction, 
you'd come into the 2008 Lehman Brothers cut crash which um, with a much more stable banking system. So you're coming along here, here's the crash, the system's much more stable than in that reality. In terms of your exposures to property risk and bar hot money foreign borrowing, okay? You'd also have a more stable borrowing, okay? This is the borrowing side. So here we have our net foreign borrowing to GDP. That's so both on the asset and liability side, a much more stable environment, okay? It actually would have, after the 2008 crash, eliminated a lot of the, we'd be just like most other European countries, with just a little bit of a change in our financial regulation. You'll see this has implications as we think about whose fault it is and what needs to go, go, go happen going forward, okay? With this, obviously, there'd be a big change in that foreign borrowing, right, by construction. So we wouldn't have this big overhang that the banks all of a sudden, as you remember in September 2008, the banks all went bust. They effectively all went bust. Because all that hot money net foreign borrowing left, and the government was, how are we going to replace this? Well, first it put in the guarantee. That didn't work. And then it went into an IMF program. Okay, Because it had to replace all that hot money, which disappeared in the flash. Okay. But here's the interesting thing. It wouldn't have been such a lovely period for you all. Okay? You remember those years. They were wonderful growth years. Why were they wonderful growth years? For false reason. It was fake income. Okay? It was generated by imprudent borrowing of the domestic banks from foreign banks. So all that wonderful 2003 through 2007 growth was phony, okay? And if we eliminate, if we bring in prudent regulation, a whole lot of growth disappears, okay? So in a sense, this was already spent, okay? And now we have to, in a sense, pay it back. And that's what the ECB, that's what the the you know, European Commission and even the IMF are telling us. You already had the good times, now you have to pay the cost. Okay? That's one way to interpret it. Right? In fact, if we look here, this is your GDP. There's your extra GDP you got by having bad decisions. Note it's only negative at the end. Okay, obviously you continue here. It's got to, in a sense, if you believe in you know, a just universe, all of this has to be balanced on the negative side, right? That would be the Greek tragedy solution, right? If Homer did this, that would all go away. So we'd pay it all back, right? In fact, here it is just graphically. There's Ireland if we would have done things right. Now, again, this is a simulated reality. And what do we see in the purple line? This purple line here is Ireland without imprudent banking regulation, which allowed this credit inflow, right? A lot less growth, and in fact, you know, it's sort of, uh, you're losing more than you're benefiting so far. So obviously, this has to continue for quite a while, right? This yellow line to make it equal, because the yellow is the reality, the purple is the simulated reality, well, if you're going to get rid of all that growth, that fake growth, you know, it's going to be paid back. And it clearly is, right? Because some, you know, we are, in a sense, going to pay all that back one way or the other. Okay? So that's sort of a review of the euro, a little bit about Ireland. Now I want to, just for my last little bit, I want to talk about the future and where things stand and what it looks like going forward. Okay? <clears throat> well, we had this big party, really. Right? Ireland had a party based on <coughs> phony money that was pouring in via the euro currency from foreign banks. Okay? Now we have to pay it back, or some feel we don't have to, but the standard view, at least by the ECB and the IMF, is we do have to pay it back. Can we pay it back? Is it feasible? Okay, that's the question. Well, this is the key number, okay, which is government debt relative to GDP. If this number is more than about 120%, so you have more debt 
then you have national income, right? Annual national income. Most people feel it can never be paid back. The reason is, what happens, it, it grows with interest and your income doesn't grow and you can never get to an equilibrium. You can never get out of debt. You can never get yourself out of debt as a country. Okay, so above 120, it's normally considered not feasible. And you can see, well, Ireland is just about, hopefully, maybe going to miss that. All right, we'll look at some of the other detail. This is just a generated problem. Note, this is not the original problem. This debt is generated by poor bank regulation. Okay? It was not even high when we started back here in 2008. When the problem started, the debt wasn't even high. So this is all coming out of bad decisions in, relative, uh, in our banking system. Okay? Let's look at the banking system because there's another big problem. When all the net foreign borrowing disappeared, it had to be replaced. It had to be paid off with cash. Banks don't have cash. A lot of people think when you give cash into a bank, they put it in a big you know, drawer in the back. That's not what happens. The cash goes out immediately. You, you put money into your savings account. The next day or the same day, they've paid it out into someone's mortgage. Okay? Your savings account isn't in the bank. It's in a mortgage. Okay? So what happened when all these foreign banks said, oh, give us our money back? They didn't have any money. In fact, their assets were collapsing at the same time. Right? They had to get money as extraordinary liquidity support from the central bank. That's one of the roles of the central bank. It provides liquidity when banks' assets are illiquid. Okay? And an enormous amount. Right? Irish banks have alike 110 billion euros of this emergency liquidity support, both from the European Central Bank and, in the case where the assets aren't good enough for the European Central Bank, from the Irish Central Bank. Okay? So these are the assets which aren't even good enough quality for the ECB to accept them. Right? There's a, that has to be changed. That's supposed to be, quote, short term. That's supposed to be the central bank providing short-term liquidity. Well, it's already been five years. How many more years is it going to be? Right? Probably five or six. These are backed by assets. Right? These are backed by mortgages, property development assets, business loans. But they are illiquid. Right? And some of them are of dodgy value. So this is a big problem, too. It isn't just the government debt. It's also the banking system becoming liquid again, okay? somehow getting rid of this overhang of emergency liquidity support. Right? <clears throat> How can it do that? Well, it's pretty hard. It has to shrink. It has to shrink its asset side to generate cash. As people pay off their mortgages and business loans, it has to use the funds to pay off this big overhang, to remove this big overhang of emergency liquidity support from the ECB. And that's a really slow process. You can see here, look at how slowly the assets are declining. Even though this red line is the stock, the flow of new lending is shrinking drastically, but the stock of outstanding lending is only very slowly inching down. And of course it builds on itself. As they shrink lending, the economy contracts. And that feeds back into itself. Because it's the whole sector, you get this aggregate effect. They, if they all try to shrink, all that happens is the economy shrinks. And it's very hard for them. So it's really difficult. There is a difficult problem. So I'm not claiming things are easy here. Okay. Obviously, property prices, which bubbled up, have also you know, gone down. And that hits banks. Right? Now, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I know Ronan Lyons talked about that. Uh, a week or two ago, but we know property prices have gone down sharply. And that's an issue for banks as well. More seriously, okay, oh, yeah, and of course, another thing about getting back this big overhang of assets, it's hard. For it, look at here how they've caused, they've shot down, and this has affected property prices, they've, the flow of new housing lending, mortgage lending, has collapsed. But that hasn't really affected very strongly the assets of the bank because it's hard to make 
property shrink by not building them because they last for 80 years, okay? So this overhang is a very slowly solvable problem. Getting into debt is easy and quick, okay? Getting out of debt as a sectoral system is slow and difficult, okay? Now, here's another really serious problem. And again, I'm just, at this point, I'm speculating about the future. This might sink the banking system. This is the increase in mortgage arrears, right? Mortgage arrears are continuing up, and there's an enormous supply of mortgages. If you go back to those balance sheets and you look at mortgages, and you look at the sliver of bank equity capital, mortgage arrears coming out of those assets, any fallen mortgage payments has to come out of that tiny sliver of equity capital. And if it overwhelms it, the banking system is, is broke, right? And there is a risk here. So this is a real serious risk going forward. Do I have a solution? Do I have an answer? No. But it's certainly something that is troubling. Okay. Okay. What about, you know, this is something I put here because just as I finish up, Colin McCarthy, who isn't here but would certainly want this slide. What are we paying for with all this debt? Okay, we have this big supply of government debt. We saw we're over, you know, we're, we're swimming in government debt. We're approaching sovereign insolvency. Where is it coming from? Well, a lot of it is coming from these bank repayment costs. This gray line, these green slash lines here, note that huge chunk in 2010. There's also a big chunk in 2009 and another big chunk in 2011. If it weren't for these bank repayment costs, even though Ireland would have suffered a big recession, the debt overhang wouldn't be serious. It would be very you know, feasible. This is making the system close to or possibly insolvent. Right? Now, this is questionable. Colin McCarthy says a lot of that was us paying back foreign banks. It was their fault. They lent us money when they shouldn't have. Okay, So it's partly their fault. And we paid them back when we were a state. This is the Irish state. It was private banks. It was the Irish nationwide and Anglo in particular, and the other banks making bad decisions. Those are private institutions. Why are we as Irish taxpayers paying them back? Okay, Well, partly to help the other European countries because it's, far, it's European banks that lent that money. Well, that's questionable. And Colin McCarthy feels, and it's very much in the news now, we don't have a responsibility as taxpayers for those privately taken on debt. Okay? And that's a lot of the problem. Right? But I'm not going to take a stand there. You can see it's a mixed case. We spent that money. right? We spent it on ourselves. But it was private money. So you can decide what you think is right or wrong about it. Colin McCarthy thinks we shouldn't have paid it back, or maybe not all of it. It's in the news even now. We're fighting with the ECB saying a lot of this money should be paid by the ECB indirectly with money creation. Because it isn't really an Irish. The Irish are doing their part. Let's have some help. And there's talk about pushing big chunks of it out far into the future using ECB money creation. So will we make it? Will Ireland make it as a sovereign through this crisis? Well, this is what's called a fan chart, where you have some possibility, right? And the answer is maybe, <laughs> OK, as an economist, right? If things turn out well, if growth is reasonable, Ireland is going to muddle through this crisis, OK? If things turn out badly and growth is poor and the debt goes up, there's going to be another program and another restructuring and more difficulty. So I don't feel I'm strong enough and wise enough to make that call. I do want to finish on an up note. There are good things in Ireland. What's going to save Ireland? If there's a savior, it's going to be our export growth. Pharma, tech in particular, and other export industries. I know a lot of people talk about agri-food industry. It's had very good years. But it can't generate, it doesn't have the scale potential to deal with 120 billion debt overhang. Whereas tech and pharma and other, the other uh, export sectors, which are actually doing very well at the moment, okay, can spin off into the domestic sectors 
and might make a difference. So if we can get growth, and this is a picture of a bunch of techie type people, if we can get growth in the key future industries, and this is something that Ireland has done well over the last 10 years, it's gotten lucky, it's picked some good industries. Okay? It picked a lousy industry in the 50s when it went very heavily on agriculture as the key industry. That was a big mistake we now know. Okay? But now it seems to have picked some good industries. So that's the hope. It's this export growth and, and the possibility that might, that might make the difference in making us coming out on the right end of this painful but feasible graph. Okay, that's it. So let me see if there are questions or comments, and then we'll stop. Go ahead. My question is multi-point. One of them is we know the, the, the banks have lent the money, and what happens if the banks now have so much money? Is it, say, for example, they have 20 million mortgages, and of, out of those 20 million, 10 million comes back and says, listen, we can't be here, have your key back. Yes. Now they have a huge chunk of houses that they cannot offload. Yes. Okay. So, uh, how do they walk through that? That is one. Then two, if they don't spend, how does liquidity recycle within yes. the economy? Yeah, that's absolutely, I mentioned that and that's very true. One of the problems with banks is they all want to shrink. So how do they want to shrink? Oh, they want to stop lending. But if they all stop lending, house prices fall, no one can buy houses, then their, their assets, which are effectively the houses, also decline. Who are they going to sell these repossessed houses to? Yeah, that's a very difficult circular problem. When, the, when one bank is in trouble, it can just repossess houses and sell them. When the whole banking system is in trouble, yeah, there is an issue that they can't all sell the houses and not, more, you know, not generate new houses. So that just has to be muddled through, and there's no simple solution to that. Of course, there's no repossessions in Ireland anyway, effectively none. So it's not a live issue. Finally, um, this is based on the assumption of what if. What if instead of having invested heavily into the mortgage, you know, the, the, the construction industry, yeah. if they had spread the investment on the um, production and, and um, you know, other, other sectors, what would it have been like going by the graph that you have yeah, I didn't, we didn't do that. In other words, put it into business investment. Uh, we didn't do that. I don't think that was feasible. It was such a, it was such a flood of credit. It was going to go into, you know, it was going to go into speculative property or nothing. And that's quite standard. If you look around the world, credit flows tend to go into speculative property because business investment is slow and difficult. You have to establish relationships. It doesn't tend to, it doesn't tend to have this volatile behavior that property development does. So most of the big bubbles generate property-related bubbles. Yes, question you. How do you see financial regulation changing in response to the events of the last couple of years? Especially oh. when, for yeah. example, when the euro was kind of set forth in the late 90s. We had the example of the Asian crisis, which showed that you know, if you liberalize financial markets, you might need to a bubble. So how come you see it then? What makes it yes. change then? <coughs> yes. You get? yes. Well, financial regulation in Ireland was particularly bad, okay, particularly bad. So if you go back to 2003, 2002, in Ireland, you know, it wasn't even at the state of it should have been at that point. Now, of course, you know, it's going much, obviously, we've learned from that mistake, and where everyone is tightening, including Ireland. Others made mistakes. The U.S. made huge, more, you know, more globally, uh, more damaging errors in their financial regulation. So there were many errors. And the Greek situation, which was not on the financial regulation side, but rather national income fraud, okay, where they actually fraudulently created their government debt accounts, it was a whole another situation. Where do I see the financial regulation going? Well, I think probably there will still be problems, as there always have been. There'll be, you know, people will find ways around the rules and create problems. So that will never disappear. There will always be smart operators who sneak around the system and create occasional crises. But I don't think in my lifetime, you know, my working life, or even my you know, mortal life, that we'll see another financial crisis of this type. However, the, another side, which is the regulation of 
government borrowing. Now that's changing fundamentally, as you know. And now we have this fiscal compact that's just absolutely changing. You've heard the word austerity. It's absolutely, the rules are gonna change fundamentally in ways which are not all good, all right? There's no longer gonna be flexibility about, oh, we really ought to have a new anti-poverty program and build some new hospitals this year. And even if it costs a little more than we have, we'll borrow it. That is going to go away, okay? It's gonna be a very tight rein on government spending in the Eurozone. That's part of the brittle system. We've locked ourselves on the mask, and we've made that decision, and now we realize part of that decision is we can no longer spend money unless we have it. And that's, you know, that's just locked in now, in my opinion. Is that not a good thing fundamentally for us? I mean, we need to grow up. Yeah, yes, I think a lot of economists are now thinking, yeah, in the long run, probably, we actually, maybe in our mindset, we think about the Germans back, you know, when they were not talking about the euro. Yeah. Germans, to characterize them unfairly, but you know, they do have a little bit of a mindset. A, B, we go this way, we're making, we're walking this way, okay? And I think they realized that was part of the deal. When we, the part of the hard currency zone was also, you know, fiscal austerity, that you don't spend what you don't have. So that's what we bought into. We didn't know we bought into it. But now, yes, that's what we bought into. Can I just ask you, that wasn't my question. I'm going okay. to say, maybe the last one. I don't know if okay. you. Uh, it's just, um, I asked the time to read the paper yet the other day, and Mr. Osborne or somebody that I'm decided in, in England announced that because the banks were not doing their part of the bargain, they were not lending to the small and the medium-sized business over there even, and we're crying out for that here even more probably. Um, they were going to do at government level some scheme that they're putting millions in that can be lent to, all, to pass, bypass the banks and get this money out to the businesses that need it to run. We obviously do need our, our small businesses to get going again to, to get them, uh, if we're getting any like nothing to boo, but to, to, to do that curve they're talking about to them. Uh, would, what, what they're doing there, could we borrow the same thing here? Would it work? Is it feasible for us? Again, we have no funds. But how are they doing? It would have to be easy to, well, see, they have funds because they're in the pound and they control their pound. They can borrow freely to some extent. I mean, there are limits even for the British, but we've locked ourselves in now to this hard currency system, which means we don't really have borrowing opportunities. The ECB, though, there is, in fact, you know, per potential. The ECB has, still has flexibility. Mm -hmm. And they have, the ECB, to give them credit, have recently generated a lot of new credit flow to the banking system. But this banking system is still in an unstable situation. So a lot of that has just been transferred effectively to Germany, where, where there's no need for new credit. So it has, it's still not flowing properly. But the ECB has forced money, forced credit into the banking system through this long-term refinancing operation. So that's, and a lot of money, like a, a trillion euros worth of credit over the last few, you know, in their program will be forced into the Eurozone banking system. Uh, but it isn't a solution. A government program, no, Ireland cannot do that under the fiscal compact. I don't think it's feasible. Let me get, get the question here. Hi, um, a, a consequence of, of the austerity that, that, that is sweeping through the Eurozone and, and the world, it seems to me, is, is huge unemployment. Uh, and uh, can, can, can that be countered? Well, that, you know, that's part, you're right. And, and a lot of people, Paul Krugman, a major uh, commentator in, uh, in the U.S. is very against austerity because of that. It does cut back your budget deficit, but at the same time, in recessionary times, it forces up unemployment. Uh, no, th there's no, I, you know, you can, Paul Krugman thinks we should just go ahead and continue borrowing. Uh, and there's probably a middle ground. I don't have a solution for you, but no, they're linked. You can't, you can't spend money to raise employment and at the same time, lower your budget deficit. You know, they're, they're just, they're, 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 you can't get both. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Question. Um, I was under the impression that the Celtic Tiger era began roughly around 1996, 97, and finished around 2007. Yes. When you were speaking about uh, credit float, you yes. focused on the years Correct. 2003 to 2008. Correct. Yes, there's the good credit. There's the good Celtic Tiger and the bad Celtic Tiger. There's phase one and phase two, and Morgan Kelly has a good paper on that. The first phase was based on productivity growth. So 97 to 2000, he says 2000, 
but it might be 2002, okay? 2002 is the date when the central bank actually became more liberal in its policies, but maybe he claims it's about 2000. So there was a good Celtic Tiger and a bad Celtic Tiger. The first one was based on real productivity gains, and the second one was based on foreign credit inflows. Uh, and you might look at Morgan Kelly as a straightforward paper about that, you know, if you're interested. Yeah. They always said to be important that the or word was invented or used, that it would be jobless recovery, not just in Ireland, in America, everywhere they said job and it was going to be It always it does. The case. Yeah, the recessions tend to, the jobs are the last thing that comes. Yes, but will they come eventually? Oh, okay. Nothing like they were. Obviously. No, I, I am a financial economist, and you really need to ask a labor guy, I you know? See. So I, I won't answer that question because I, if, I, if someone found out I was claiming I knew yeah. about employment, you know, but trends, I, I'd get in trouble. In yes. relation to what you said about employment, you know, I know um, countries like Japan, um, China, and even Germany at a certain time had shut their doors to themselves and said, listen, okay, we're in this mess now. What if we, if we just look inwards instead of Having to say, okay, I'm extra because I, I, yeah, I understand the petrol thing and the Euro, Euro policies or Eurozone policies. But if Ireland as a, a nation now says, okay, we need indoors, shut the doors and let's see what we can make from our you know, oh, country. Gotcha. Have. No, uh, Ireland, the small open, small open is Ireland's solution. I really think small and open, we are small and open, and small and open is the future. In fact, that's the future, small and open. I mean, what are these guys doing, you know? They're selling around the world. That's the key thing. Little technologies that are not particularly high, you know, yes, not particularly export. fancy, yes, they were sold export. everywhere. But reduce the, the, the uh, import and a lot of other things. Reduce the what? Imports rather than... Oh, no, because they need imports. No, no, I don't think that's the solution for Ireland. No, I have to say, I'd say absolutely not, in my opinion. Absolutely not, yes. Yeah, um, just there recently, you know, a couple months ago, you had the government basically calling on the banks to reduce the interest rates, you know, for the lending. Like, how can the banks get the money to lend if when they try and increase their profits, they get brought in and say, look, we can't do that? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah that, that's, so true. that's true. Uh, yeah, that, that was a very, and that was pretty at the time. You know, there's it. a real, there's, because they want bank profits. Because how are you going to get the banks back to a decent situation by having them generate profits? But at the same time, you want lending, and you don't want it to be too high cost. Yeah, uh, you know, th this whole system is nothing but a balancing act of difficult, interlinked problems. That's what debt, you know, unraveling the debt problem. It's a difficult, when it's aggregate in the whole economy, it's a difficult and slow process. And whether we'll get there, is, you know, going back to your point, you know, unemployment and the, the government debt, we have a huge government de debt problem and we have an unemployment problem. How do you solve an unemployment problem? Government expenditures. How do you solve a debt problem? Not having government expenditures. You know, what do you need to get your debt low? You need growth. How do you get growth? Spend more, but that's also how you get debt. So yes, there's all these difficult decisions at the margin, right? That's why we have to hope these guys you know, do a good job selling whatever they're selling. Yeah, go ahead. I better just take two more and we better stop, I'd say. And go ahead. Did somebody did say part of the problem was a failure of what they call the political class. Do you see younger political grouping coming up of people in the thirties or forties who are ready to take power or they all are just leaving? I don't see anybody, you know, in the media that uh, seems to be ready to go to government and replace what when the uh, our peasant crop retires they will have to vent that. Uh, I, you know, are there people there you, you think could get a leadership? Are they, are they coming into or do you meet people because you're in that? I, I, you know, I, I, that question is beyond me. I, do, I didn't mention, but the political class in the noughties, in the second half of the Celtic Tire, did fail in a really spectacular way in financial regulation. And property, I mean, the mountain through the tribunal issues, they were also related to property. So there was a very corrupt system for developed Western economy in the early years of the 21st century. Yeah, uh, but but how will we replace that beyond me? I'm sorry, I, you know, I've only lived in this country 20 years, so I'm not old enough. Go ahead. This is actually similar to what this gentleman was talking about. I'm sorry, about competitiveness. I mean, yes. this is not a big issue in terms of that the price of everything uh, went up in Ireland, that we became 
Correct. Best in the second part of the Irish uh, well, we Celtic we Tiger. We're correct. We're tied back into vested interests and the political class is the sense that still like doctors' fees, like dentists, professional fees are still much higher yes. than there are in yes. the rest of Europe. And, yes. and this is still obviously an issue in terms of the paper, yes. the special fees, and we, the government has to pay for them. So, yes, I mean, yes absolutely. That problem. I think that absolutely is really, you know, one of the things to get the economy continuing to, it has had a big improvement in competitiveness over the over this terrible five-year period or four-year period, but at the same time, that has to not stop. But that's something where they're making progress. There is some slow progress, I think, on that one. Yeah. Okay, so thanks very much, and I hope you enjoyed the Got Something.